Welcome back to the Slocky Horror Picture Show and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I trust you're enjoying my old mate John Barrymore as yet another scientist who's punished for not knowing his place and tampering with the supernatural. He filmed this while preparing for a stage production of Richard III and it was the turning point in his film career. Prior to this, his films were light-hearted action adventures such as The Incorrigible Duquesne and Raffles. But with the success of tonight's multi-level performance, the studios cast him in more challenging roles. His triumphs continued into the sound era, for he had a most agreeable voice. I had no fear of the talkies either, but for some obscure reason, I was rarely offered roles with any dialogue. They probably thought my mere presence was enough, and were afraid that I'd upstage my co-stars. Yes, I like the sound of that explanation. And before you ask, no, that's not me playing the skull on Dr. Jekyll's desk. John and I never actually worked together, and that part was played by one of my rivals, whose name escapes my memory at present. John accomplished the final part of that transformation scene by just contorting his face. He later told me that he filled the vials with alcohol, but mischievous crew members replaced it with raspberry cordial, and that's the way he always reacted when he accidentally drank liquids that weren't alcohol. His strange reaction to the antidote was due to his realising that he'd fallen for the same trick twice. He was careful to ensure it did not happen a third time. The director, John S. Robertson, hailed from Canada and began acting in films in 1915, but soon switched to directing. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde was his final major box office success, and he followed it with Tess of the Storm Country with fellow Canadian Mary Pickford, Annie Laurie with Lillian Gish, and The Single Standard with Greta Garbo. His last film was The Shirley Temple Vehicle, Our Little Girl, in 1935. He then retired to California where, with his grey handlebar moustache and Stetson hat, he caught the attention of local children, one of whom grew up to be bass guitarist for the 60s rock group The Birds and wrote the song called Old John Robertson in 1968. What a pity old John didn't live to hear it, having shuffled off this mortal coil in 1964. Making her film debut as Miss Gina was Ziegfeld girl Nita Naldi, who was born with the more ordinary name of Donna Dooley. After this film, she played vamps in several films of the 20s. In The Man From Beyond, she tested the moral fibre of Harry Houdini who, as to be expected, escaped unsoiled. That same year, she brought about the downfall of Rudolph Valentino in Blood and Sand. Next, in The Ten Commandments, she played the scarlet woman who infects Rod LaRock with leprosy. When she encountered Rudolph Valentino again in Cobra, he'd learnt his lesson, resisted her wiles, kept his virtue intact, and she destroyed herself. Nita went to Germany in 1926 to star in Alfred Hitchcock's second film, The Mountain Eagle, uh, which has since been lost. Fatigued by all that vamping, she retired from films in 1927, slipped into obscurity and passed away in 1961. Film buffs should recognise the music hall owner as Lewis Walheim, who by the end of the decade had a supporting role in All Quiet on the Western Front. He was given that broken nose playing football at university and was working as a maths teacher when he caught the attention of Lionel Barrymore, who told me with a face like that, he had a future in films. Lewis had started rehearsing as the ruthless editor of The Front Page when cancer finally caught up with him in 1931. The source of all the trouble tonight, Sir George Carew, is played by English character actor Brandon Hurst. Loyal viewers will remember him as the evil manservant in White Zombie and can look forward to seeing him commit more villainy in The Hunchback of Notre Dame, which I will present for you at a later date, you lucky people. Playing Dr. Jekyll's saintly fiancé Millicent is Martha Mansfield. She was a musical comedy star in New York before becoming Max Linder's film co-star and probably should have stayed put. After this, she was in a series of financially successful but undistinguished films until 1923, when catastrophic misfortune befell her. She was starring in the Civil War drama The Warrens of Virginia and wearing one of those huge dresses that were so trendy at the time. The hem of her dress came into contact with a cigarette discarded by one of the crew, and within moments she was a mass of flames. Her co-stars smothered the fire, but it was too late and the unfortunate lady passed away the following day. And with that tragic story having put you in an appropriately sombre mood, we'll now return to Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. 